the stress eigenvalue problem is the same as the strain eigenvalue problem. In the case of strains, we were looking for those principal directions which were allowing only the stretching and squishing or fibers. The eigenvalue problem related to stresses is the same as the strain eigenvalue problem. In the case of stresses, we are looking for those principal directions which would either undergo tension or compression without any shear force. So those directions where the shear forces are zero, they will be the principal directions. So again, looking at our sphere of vectors, we are saying that in the case of undeformed structure, if we take a point of reference in such a way that there are infinite vectors coming out of that point, these vectors would be corresponding to fibers that are connected to the point of reference. In the case of stresses, these vectors show the potential directions of, of force after the application of the load. Before application of the load, all these vectors are of same magnitude. Thus, they all can be encapsulated into a sphere. If these vectors are acted by the stress tensor, which is normally indicated by S or T, then some of these fibers will be under tension and some under compression. Also, looking at two adjacent fibers, we would be able to tell whether the relative angle between them have changed or not, or in other words, whether they have undergone any shear force. As we discussed previously, in the case of principal directions, we would have the fibers undergoing axial force in such a way that the direction doesn't change. So the fiber would be subject to tension force after the application of the load or would be subject to compression force, but no shear force. So again, if we have three principal directions shown in green, after applying the tensor, the stress tensor, the vectors would be subject to either tension force or compression force. So if we have three principal directions and we act those vectors in the principal direction by a stress tensor, we would have change in magnitude of these forces, but without any change in direction. So mathematically, we can say that the stress tensor, when acted upon a vector, will give us the vector time some scalar value. Opening the brackets and solving will give us three equations, bringing the right-hand side to the left-hand side and taking common will give us L time sigma 1, 1 minus sigma minus M time sigma 2, 1 plus N time sigma 3, 1. Second equation is L time sigma 1, 2 plus M time in bracket sigma 2, 2 minus sigma plus N time sigma 3, 2. The third equation is L times sigma 1, 3 plus M times sigma 2, 3 plus N times sigma 3, 3 minus sigma equal to 0. We can take determinant of these three equations and equate that to 0. Expanding the determinant, we will get a characteristic equation. This characteristic equation has got three coefficients which are defined. The first coefficient is I1 prime, which is equal to the sum of the diagonal elements of the stress tensor. The second one is equal to the sum of cofactor of the diagonal term of stress tensor. The third invariant is the determinant of stress tensor. From the property of roots of cubic equation, it can be shown that I1 is, is the scalar sigma 1 plus scalar sigma 2 plus scalar sigma 3. I2 prime is 
sigma 1, sigma 2, plus sigma 2, sigma 3, plus sigma 3, sigma 1. And I3 prime is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. The quantity I1 prime, I2 prime, and I3 prime shown over here are the invariants of stress tensor. That is, their values would be the same regardless of rotation of the coordinate axis. Please note that the scalar sigma 1, scalar sigma 2, and scalar sigma 3 are the are the eigenvalues of this equation. Once the eigenvalue is found from the characteristic equation, they can be plugged back into the eigenvalue problem and uh, along with the identity L square plus M square plus N square equal to one, we can determine the three principal directions.